All right, what's going on, guys? This is a National Signing Day edition of the Wrap-Up Show. Good to be with you. We're going to talk some Aztec football. We'll mix in some Aztec basketball as well. Be with you for, uh, let's say, the next, you tell me. I mean, we'll be here as long as we need to be, next 45 minutes or an hour. Exciting times. I mean, it really is exciting times right now on the Mesa. Um, and congratulations in order to Sean Lewis and his staff on um, – compiling this class in a short period of time. Um, also to the previous staff, because a number of these players are committed to Brady Hoke and his staff. I think he had 11 early signing commits verbally when um, there was a changeover, obviously, at head coach after Brady retired. And I want to say that Sean Lewis was able to retain nine of those 11 verbal commitments, which is a really impressive feat considering the age that we're in right now with college football. So a credit to Sean Lewis and his staff. And I think Aztec fans... Um, are really thrilled. I, I think Aztec fans, and I want to hear from you tonight and comment in the chat. Uh, if you are here, whether it's live or on replay, would love to see some um, some comments uh, in the chat. And I'll try to get to as many as I can here tonight. Well, with how this came together in such a short period of time, when you think about reasons for San Diego State using the timeline that they use, right? The importance of bringing in Sean Lewis a couple of weeks ago as opposed to right now, put him in a position where he was able to, you know, compile this type of class. Now, it's about more than obviously just the 2024 class, but all of these, you know, every single player, every single class matters. And the complexion of a roster is crucially important. And it's something you deal in, deal with day in and day out. And Sean Lewis talked about that a little bit today when he met with the media on the Mesa. I was there earlier. We talked about it today. I'm John and Jim. I appreciate Paul Garrison for joining me uh, today. Paul's doing great work with the SDSB podcast and the Sons of Montezuma. He's doing some stuff here tonight, so great to see all the people uh, providing Aztec content for San Diego State fans because people are excited, uh, and we're here to talk about that here tonight. Um, by my own admission, I'm not an expert when it comes to high school football or transfer portal and recruiting. I follow this story like a lot of you do. I don't know all the intricacies or details of all the players that San Diego State has signed today. I don't necessarily know what's to come in the days, weeks, and months ahead either, but I'm here to just kind of you know enjoy this and interact with you and talk about some of these players and and see what you know is to come here to San Diego State but today really I think obviously anytime you're talking about football and Sean Lewis has said this he said this to Darren Smith today on San Diego Sports 760 obviously it starts with the quarterback position especially for a play caller and someone that's one of the better offenses in the country over the last decade wherever he's been so it starts with quarterbacks, and San Diego State addressed that here today. Now, they already have a quarterback room with three or four returning players, and they've added to that here today. Some of the names we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, we never would have heard Danny O'Neill's name if not for Sean Lewis. Right? Danny O'Neill was a verbal commit and apparently a pretty solid one to Colorado. But then Lewis had this opportunity on the Mesa. Danny O'Neill decommitted, took an official and is now committed on early signing day to San Diego State. And it's an, it's an amazing story. I mean, an Elite 11 finalist, um, a high three-star recruit that has been a winner in high school in Indianapolis. Um, you know, you look at the numbers, they jump off the page. And he's someone that, in talking to him, because I had him on the radio, was it this week or last, he, he thinks he's going to be able to really have success in Sean Lewis's offense. He feels like there are some similarities to what he's been asked to do with Cathedral in Indianapolis to what he could be asked to do at San Diego State, whenever it is, as he competes for the job. As I think all these quarterbacks, to be honest, I really do believe that you got four, five, six guys that are competing for that quarterback job because you don't have, as it stands currently, and things can change, you don't have that player that's got you know 13 career starts or 300 career pass attempts. I think the most pass attempts in San Diego State's quarterback room, collegiate pass attempts, is 17. I think I heard that tonight on the SDSU podcast, and I think that's Kyle Crum. So you've got Danny O'Neill, and there's been a lot of excitement around O'Neill, speculation, anticipation, and we we learned of his verbal commit within the last week, and then he officially signs here today. And then I think more under the radar – but equal in terms of excitement was A.J. Duffy out of the Inland Empire who spent the last two years at Florida State. Now, he rarely got on the field. He only had a few pass attempts in his career. We know how good Florida State has been, specifically this past year, obviously, with their undefeated season. But a four-star recruit out of high school was in Southern California. There was the pandemic. He moved east after missing an entire year because of the pandemic when there wasn't high school football in California. I want to say in the fall of 2020, he was at IMG in 2021 has been at Florida State 
the last couple of years, but that's exciting. You get a third-year player in A.J. Duffy. Again, not a ton of opportunities so far in college, but he's been at Florida State. He's been an outstanding quarterback room, and I think Duffy and O'Neal teaming with the rest of that room um, is something to be excited about and encouraged about. We'll see what happens when they hit the ground running collectively in January. And, oh, by the way, Danny O'Neill, who's a freshman, will be an early enrollee and on campus um, again in January. I think the first maybe conditioning begins in that January 16th or 17th range. So semester will begin in that time frame, right, the middle of January, maybe the second week of January. So you'll have Danny O'Neill on campus. You will have A.J. Duffy as well. Now, some of these high school players, I don't have the, the full list of who's an early enrollee and who will be coming – in summertime, but you you know you have a good number of players that will be here early, competing, learning, getting stronger, going through the weight program, and I think typically that's encouraging. And for those that make it in the summer as well, um, you know whatever the circumstance is, because you're leaving high school, not everyone's going to be an early enrollee. But a lot of these guys will be here in January. The rest will be here, obviously, in the summer. I think you look at the class in general, and oh by the way, if you are here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, I really do appreciate that. This is a relatively new channel um, that we've just gotten off the ground. So if you wouldn't mind subscribing, if you're here, I do appreciate that. If you wouldn't mind smashing the like button for me, I appreciate that as well. Um, I think we now have the ability on the chat or in the channel for super chat and super stickers and memberships, memberships of emojis and badges. And we got a couple of different tiers with that. So if you want to support the channel, if you want to make sure I get your comment here tonight, and I'll get to as many as I possibly can, whether it's a super chat or not, but you can always click that dollar sign below the chat box. We'll get to as many comments here tonight as we possibly can. So let me continue with my soliloquy before I kind of look at the chat here tonight. But, you know, you're, you're thinking offense, obviously. We San Diego State coming off a four and eight year, coming off a year in which they didn't have the, you know, they, they didn't have the success they were hoping to have offensively, obviously, last year. And that's not just offense, by the way, for being fair. I mean, even a four and eight overall, it's not just to blame one position or one side of football. I mean, there's, there's three areas here, whether it's offense, defense, special teams. And San Diego State went 4-8, and it's not because of one side of the ball. It's not because of one position. It's not because of, because of one player. And if you're an Aztec fan and you watch this year, I think you would agree with what I'm saying. But with Sean Lewis, I think your first thought is, what is he going to mean for the offense? So you think about the quarterback position. But then you look at some of the receivers that he has brought in here, and you got some returnees. Um, and I don't have the full list in front of me, but someone like Dylan Brooks, who tweeted after Sean Lewis was hired saying, we got our guy, a true freshman with so much promise that we saw um, during his year here in 2023, you've added some veteran receivers to this group. Ja'Shawn Polk, for example, is a name that popped up here today, was a four-year player at Kent State. I think I have that right. Either a three- or four-year player at Kent State and spent last year at West Virginia, has the COVID year. So he's going to finish his collegiate career at San Diego State. And a guy that's had success has played under Sean Lewis previously. So that's very intriguing. 5'10", senior receiver who's bounced around a little bit, will be reunited here with Sean Lewis. In addition to that, you've got a Portland State transfer out of FCS who's got size. And something I'm noticing here in this receiver class is the size that they possess. Nate Bennett is 6'3". You look at some of the freshman receivers they signed today. Ben Scolari is a 6'3 receiver. We'll see in Freene out of Carlsbad, 6'4 receiver. So you've got some height in that receiver room, which can pay dividends, you would imagine, and there's got to be a reason um, for the fact that they are recruiting some size there on the outside. Again, focus 5'10", but a guy that's had a lot of success and had a lot of opportunities over the last handful of years, whether it's been at Kent State or again this past year at Westford. Now, you've got tight ends as well in this class, um, one of which, one of which, um, I'm just trying to pull up a couple of tweets here to find, I'm trying to keep everything organized. Um, I don't think we saw, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we saw Michael Harrison on this early enrollee list today. He was the verbal commit from Colorado to San Diego State, had a nice year, 31 catches, big game against Colorado State. Remember that Colorado-Colorado State overtime game when Colorado started the year 3-0? That game in Boulder, he had two touchdown receptions in that game. Um, so he's a you know, tight end receiver threat. We don't yet see him on this list, I'm presuming, based on the information we had received on social media within the last week that he will be in this class. But again, until it's official, it's not official. There is a Vancouver, Washington product, Arthur Ban, in this class, 6'5", 205 pound freshman tight end. Um, Ryan Wolfer is a freshman tight end out of Liberty High School in Peoria, 6'5", 
So there's a few tight ends in this class. And then there's also a couple of running backs in this class, one of which was a look today from San Jose State that received a lot of publicity today. Sincere Rainey, I think I'm saying that right. Sincere Rainey out of Sarah High in L.A. that has been a verbal commit to San Jose State for at least a period of time, flipping today to San Diego State. Um, in addition, signing today, Anthony McMillan Jr., highly coveted tailback out of modern day, the success they've had the last couple years in Chula. Speaking of Chula, Isaiah Buxton is in this class in the secondary as a defensive back who played at modern day as well. So we know this. You've heard previous staffs talk about this, Rocky Long, Brady Hoke, and now Sean Lewis, that you can do a lot of your recruiting within 60, 70, 80, 90 miles of San Diego State, right? I mean, you could you could fill out an entire roster within 60, 70, 80 miles of San Diego State. We know how often Power Five programs have dipped their toes into San Diego County, counties that surround it, Riverside, Orange, of course, Los Angeles, as we know. Um, but San Diego State was able to keep a lot of Californians in this class. There's a number of San Diegans in this class. There's a number of, you know, people from Southern California, again, players from Southern California, whether it's LA, Riverside, Inland Empire, right? You get the point. So I think it's kind of starts in California. Aztecs have had a lot of success over the years in Texas as well, but I think it's always going to start and end in California. And there's reasons for that, not just in California. I think it kind of starts in San Diego County. They've talked about building that, you know, proverbial fence around the county. And I think it's something that um, with this early class, you know, you look at some of these San Diegans and they should feel pretty um, pleased with their, their their ability to keep some of these San Diegans home. And you, you got some flips here late, like Buxton, who was a Power 5 commit. O'Neill, Power 5 commit. Uh, Rainey, who was committed to a Group of 5 program at San Jose State. San Jose State's had a lot of success the last four, four years, right? Won a Mountain West title the COVID year in 2020. Uh, they've had a lot of offensive success over the last four years. To get Rainey from San Jose State, I think, is a win. You get Duffy in the portal from Florida State. Um, so those are just some of the names. You get Sean Polk, again, from West Virginia. Um, we'll talk about the defensive side of the ball as well. And by the way, I apologize if I don't mention every name. Some of these names, by the way, are hard for me from a pronunciation perspective because I haven't seen them. So if I don't mention a name, um, it, please don't take that personally. If you're here and maybe a um, fan of some of these players or related or one of these players, you know, it, it's not personal. It's, it's such a large class. And again, my specialty, if I'm being truly transparent and honest, is not, um, you know, covering high school football recruiting or even the transfer portal i mean we've been uber aware of this as aztec fans over the last three weeks watching sean lewis put together a staff and put together a class but i'd be lying to you if i told you i knew everything about marlon lewis who's um you know a d lineman coming from the university of richmond in fcs i do know this he's had a lot of success a lot of tackles for losses a lot of sacks in his career at richmond all um caa performer i want to say in a very good fcs league um, and he's got size, you know, 6'3", 250, as we talk a little bit about the defensive side of the, the ball. When you think defense and you think immediate impact, you look at some of these guys they get in the portal, right? You always think about offensive and defensive line in terms of starting your team, right? You have to be strong up front. There is no good weaponry on the outside or skill. or There is no good offense without a good offensive line. There is no good defense without a good defensive line, right? I think we can all agree on that. Uh, but Lewis, I think, is going to fill a hole on that defensive line. Zach Morris is a New Mexico transfer. He's a corner. Remember, they're going to be playing a 4 2 5. So you're going to see a lot of corners, whether it's via portal or in recruiting or on the roster, because you're going to have five on the field at all times or, you know, secondary players on the field at all times. So you're going to need a lot of players in your secondary, as we've seen over the years, even in that 3 3 5. And then there's William Nimmo Jr who transfers from UCLA. We saw him here at Snapdragon last year in that UCLA victory over San Diego State. He's played a good amount. He's gotten on the field a lot, you know, the last three years at UCLA, and he is a senior transfer to San Diego State at safety. That's a name to keep an eye on. Bryce Phillips, an athlete corner who was at Tennessee State in FCS, is part of this class. Um, speaking of offensive line, Nate Williams is a senior offensive lineman, 6'6", 300 pounds, transfer from Akron. He spent four years, I think, at Akron. Braden Bryant is an offensive lineman, University of North Dakota transfer, FCS, 6'2", 305. I'm trying to run through as many as I can. Um, there is a freshman lineman, I'm, I'm not going to say this right, out of American Samoa, Sapale Fuo, 
Maono, potentially 6'3", 300 pounds. Um, you've got uh, Buxton I talked about. Tayton, is it Bayer or Bear? I'm not certain. At a centennial here, uh, highly sought after cornerback as well. You have Kai Holick in this class, freshman offensive lineman, listed at 6'8", 300 pounds out of O'Day High in Seattle. Another corner or DB, Prince Williams, um, a freshman. I'm trying to see a couple of other players that I haven't yet mentioned. Ryan Gaia, or is it Gaia? Gaia. Um, 6'4", D end from St. Mary's High in Stockton. And uh, Danny New is a six-foot freshman linebacker as well in that in this class. I think Gabe Garrett, six-foot tight end also. Um, that was at um, out of Chico, California. So, and he was about to be a sophomore, by the way. So, I think I've mentioned everyone um, that has signed so far that is a member of this 2024 class. So, apologize, I'm all over the place here, but um, you know, that's just the overall synopsis of what Sean Lewis has been able to do in terms of you know, where this class ranks. I think you always have to be careful with that. I think that fans get more enamored with that than coaching staffs and players do if we're being honest of course there's value in having you know one of the top classes in the country or one of the top classes in your league or having success in recruiting i mean recruiting is the pipeline to success the wins and losses in college football but the star system isn't always the perfect indicator what you're trying to address is needs and what you're trying to do is find players in your system so there's a subjectivity to that obviously and while i've seen some uh, recruiting services say San Diego State is the best class in the Mountain West. I think that's a credit to John Lewis and his staff. But now it's what happens once these players get on campus. How are they developed? And what do they make of their time here on the Mesa? And when you look at the overall rankings, and, you know, I think among Group of Five programs, San Diego State's right up there. They've got one of the better Group of Five classes in the country when you look at some of these publications and services that come So the Athletic at San Diego State with the top 10 class in the Group of Five here today. Less overall, maybe in the in the 60s in FBS football, but you got to take that with a grain of salt. You hear, oh my gosh, they got a, the 60th best class. How are they ever going to be a top 25 program? When you look at the recruiting history of San Diego State over the last 10 or 15 years, they're not finishing with top 30 classes. You know, the services would tell you they've got the 70th best class or the 90th best class or the second or third best class in the Mountain West. Yet San Diego State um, routinely in the last decade, they still had five 10 win seasons, I think, in the last nine full years. Five, ten win seasons in the last nine full years. If you took the COVID year out, they've been in the top 25 a lot in the last decade. Uh, at least a handful of those seasons has San Diego State appeared in the top 25. Most of the times, they were inside the top 20. And they're not doing it with the top 20 class. They're doing it with players that fit their system that are developed properly. And that's where, again, I think you really credit Sean Lewis. You look at what he did at Kent State. I promise you this. Um, he wasn't you know, winning the recruiting game, right? He wasn't finishing with top 40 classes actually can stay, but he was getting players that fit his system and he was developing them and he was able to field winning teams that got to bowl games and won a bowl game for the first time in Kent State history. So again, I think you always have to say that. Um, I'm always wary. I don't think it's fair when someone says, oh, this is a two-star player and there's two-star players that end up you know, getting drafted and then there's five-star players that don't get drafted and there's undrafted players that are stars in the NFL and there's guys that are drafted that aren't stars in the NFL. So it's what do you make of the opportunity that's presented to you? And the truth is a little bit like the NFL. It's like you get to the NFL, does anyone care if you went to Penn State or San Diego State? You just got to win the job. I mean, nobody cares. No no one on earth cares if you went to Georgia or San Diego State when you're fighting for the 53rd spot on a NFL roster. Who's the better player? It doesn't matter if you spent the last four years in Athens or San Diego. It is inconsequential in the NFL. And I think there's something to be said for that, too, coming out of high school or transferring in. Everyone kind of starts on an equal footing, especially with the staff change. Of course, you have established players coming back. Of course, you have players with experience that can benefit you that may be ahead of others in a packing order. But the truth is, whether you were a two-star or a four-star, at the end of the day, you got to win the job. you got to compete, whether you're five-star or no-star. Um, so I think sometimes we get carried away with that. But there's reasons for excitement because they're getting players that they wanted to bring in and they're addressing needs that they have. And again, quarterback position, obviously crucially important. And in this RPO offense that Sean Lewis runs and calls plays for, he wants to have players that he feels comfortable with. So the Daniel Hills, the A.J. Duffy's, the players he has in the room, spring football starting in March, 
conditioning starts in January. Uh, we'll see what transpires over the next seven or eight months. And then the other story that we have been following here today, in addition to Michael Harrison, the tight end, again, we haven't seen his name yet, although he was a verbal commit, is Jordan Anderson, who is a, again, I just told you to discount the stars, and then I'll tell you, he's a four star wide receiver that he committed from Oregon within the last week, maybe a week or 10 days. And then what we have seen play out is over the last maybe 48 or 72 hours that it appeared as if Anderson is currently down to two schools, Oregon State and San Diego State, where the two schools will play at Snapdragon here in 2024. So it feels like he's an impact piece potentially for someone. Um, he was admit to Oregon. I think, you know, it tells you about his athleticism, ability, prospects moving forward. And I thought initially we heard he was going to make an announcement at some point today, and it appears as if that's been put off. So will he make an announcement during the early signing period? If so, he's got another 48 hours or so to do it. If not, he doesn't have to do it. He could put it off until the late signing window, which is in February. Um, but it is a name to keep an eye on as they try to round out this early class. Will Jordan Anderson be a part of it? By the way, no one player. You know, I, I think it's fair to say it, it, no one player makes or breaks the class. You, right? You're talking about 30-plus players for San Diego State between the early signees and then the portal, and then the late signees in February. It's going to be a very large class. You're talking about 30-plus scholarship student athletes out of 85 scholarships. So you want to do as well as possible, but you understand that Alabama loses out to Georgia, and LSU loses out to Ole Miss, and it happens everywhere. So San Diego State, like any program in the country, isn't going to be able to lend every single one of the prospects that are on their radar. But they've had a lot of wins here in the last couple of weeks, and we'll see if they get another with Jordan Anderson, it feels like it would be a nice feather in the cap to, to land him. But again, it's not the end-all, be-all. Um, it's how I would look at it just from the outside. Any one player, right? Is it, it's hard to say that any one player completely makes a class. And any one player is the difference necessarily between winning and losing. It's team sport. And there's a lot that goes into it, obviously. But again, it's also about acquisition, talent acquisition. And that's what Sean Lewis and his staff have been able to do here over the last 21 days. It, it's hard to believe it's only been... 21 days since Sean Lewis was hired. He met, he told the media this today. He spent three full days meeting with the current team and discussing the importance of the players on this roster to him before going outside and addressing needs. So he addressed his team before any needs outside. He also brought in the previous verbal commits to express his desire to keep them on the Mesa. And again, as we talked about earlier, it appears as if he did a pretty incredible job in terms of keeping the class together and then adding to it because he had 11 players. Brady had 11 players in that class before retiring, and nine of those players have already signed. So that, that's impressive. I think you've seen before in college football elsewhere that you could have a class completely evaporate with a coaching change. It did not happen at San Diego State, not only did that not happen, they've clearly added to it with the O'Neills and the Duffies and the Portal and the rest of the high school recruiting they've done here over the last uh, 21 days. So again, if you are here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, really do appreciate that. I have year-round content for San Diego State football and basketball fans. This is the early National Signing Day special here we're doing here on the wrap-up show presented by Higher Impact Financial. I'll tell you more about my friend Eric Lanier at Higher Impact Financial coming up in the next handful of minutes. But if you want to have a comment, if you want to comment, do so right now in the live chat. If you're watching on replay, please put it in the comments down below. I'll do my best to get to as many of these as we can here over the next uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, Sean, appreciate you, man. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for being in the chat tonight. He says, the most underrated pickup of the day, Sean Polk, or Jay Sean Polk, when healthy, he was a beast at Kent. Um, appreciate that, Sean. And I don't have you know, a keen familiarity with when Sean Lewis was at Kent State, but I did see Polk's bio, and I see he's gone over 1,000 career yards. He's had over 80 career touchdowns. He's been a returner in the kick return game, I know, in his career as well. Um, I know he had a lot of offers coming out of high school, and, again, he's played a lot of college football, and he's appeared in 37 games over five years, four years at Kent State with Sean Lewis, one year, 2023 at West Virginia, now being reunited. Sean Lewis, that feels like, Sean, to your point, a pretty important name and someone to keep our eye on and heading into 2024. It feels like someone that could make an impact for the Aztecs, um, assuming he can stay healthy again. Like you said, when healthy, he was 
really, really valuable um, at Kent State. Uh, Don, thank you. He says the staff has only been on the job for three weeks and have knocked it out of the park with this recruiting class. Can't wait to see what they do with a full year. Um, it is an interesting point, right? Um, I think Sean Lewis used the analogy of speed dating earlier today because typically you're building relationships over a longer period of time, like his relationship with Danny O'Neill at Colorado dates back now over one year. Um, but it doesn't always have to be the case. And we know that in today's climate and in modern college football, there's a lot of change, whether it's via the portal, um, whether it's via high school recruiting with flips, whether it's with co coaching staff changes. So change is the norm. And San Diego State had changed. They're not the only program in the country that witnessed change over the last month or so. And um, they've made the most of the adversity. And I think they did put together a class that we feel really good about. It'll be interesting to see how it continues to come together. And to your point, Don, like what does it look like in 2025? And, you know, Sean Lewis, I think, made a point to say at both his introductory press conference and again here today that it will always start with the freshman class, right? The high school ranks, bringing them in and developing those players, right? And you will supplement and complement via portal. But San Diego State is never going to be a program. I shouldn't say never because that's not fair, but San Diego State is, is not going to be the program that has unbelievable resources at NIL that are going to be competing with programs the SEC or the Big Ten. I mean, that's not reasonable to think. So you can supplement and complement, which is something that Brady did in the last couple of years, but you're not going to build a complete class via the portal, nor do you really necessarily want to, because you want to have, like Brian Dutcher talks about with basketball, like coach guys three, four, five-year players, and then you complement that group potentially with some players that can benefit you for one, two, or three years in the portal. But it's never going to be fully built in the portal. And I think it's always going to be a route for San Diego State and Sean Lewis. Uh, Journey, thank you. He says, what's your overall feel about this new class? I think my if there's one word, and I've already used it probably 10 times tonight, if not more, it's just, I've said exciting. I would say optimistic. I think I'm very optimistic when I see Again, I, I don't know all these names. I think very few people do. But I think when I see the type of players, and of course, we're talking about all positions, but the type of players, it seems like there was a purpose that they were trying to accomplish. Higher ceiling type players, um, real skill on the outside, um, some accomplished quarterbacks, um, the way they added late to the class, whether it was the running back flip we talked about, the UCLA safety, William Nimmo, which is a position of need. Zach Morris out of New Mexico. Uh, Bryce Phillips, corner out of Tennessee State. Nate Williams, defensive lineman out of Akron. It, it felt like they hit positions of need, and it feels like they got some real upside skill in this class. Tierney with the San Jose State flip. Um, we'll see again about Colorado transfer tight end Michael Harrison, who we believe is part of this class. Um, and then some really – Promising young local players, Anthony McMillan, Isaiah Buxton, like guys you've heard their names before, Wilson and Freeney, and Carlsbad, like some really good San Diego County players that have won at a very high level, right? State championship titles, um, winning teams, successful programs. So, again, from afar, without knowing all the complexities or every single thing that they've addressed, it feels like it was extremely successful. To what extent? We're going to find out. And by the way, we're not going to find out solely in 2024, solely during fall camp or solely in the opener against Texas A&M. It'll play out over a period of one, two, three, and even more years. Uh, Christopher, thank you. He says, Nate Williams was my sleeper pickup O-line. Probably already knows the system. Um, yes, I've played at Akron. Um, there's a familiarity, um, I think, with some members of the coaching staff. Um, four-year college player, so you're getting a veteran. It's always helpful to supplement right with a fourth or fifth-year player that you can just plug in immediately. So um, that's definitely a possibility, Christopher. Uh, Don says, can't wait to see what they do with a full year. Oh, talking about recruiting. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I mean, imagine what they're capable of doing. Um, some of it will be based on the successes they have in 2024, and some of it is just about relationship building for a full year as opposed to one month or three weeks. Uh, what's going on? Loyal, loyal viewer of uh, – Wrap-up shows, whether it's Padres or Aztecs or John and Jim. Thank you for hanging out. She says, can't wait for next season already. Feeling good about the new class at Journey Krista. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate it. Um, 
I think this plays out, Christopher. I think typically you've got four or five quarterbacks in a room, four or five scholarship quarterbacks. I think that's typical in roster building. You are right. It's typical four scholarship quarterbacks. I think that's typical. Someone correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but she's still spring football, and some of this is going to play out, as it always does with competition, as it always does. So um, I think they'll all have opportunities. because I don't think there's anyone. Again, you didn't bring in that fifth-year player that – your starter at Iowa State, right? That, the writing would be on the wall if, if that theoretical player existed. Um, but they're bringing in players that are hungry, that have limited experience at college, or are coming out of the high school ranks. But I, I think it'll be a true open competition that'll play out in both the spring and the fall. Um, let me ban this one viewer. Tom, what's going on? I appreciate you, man. Really do. He says, uh, I like this optimistic uh, look, Tom. I think that's very that's very reasonable. I'm sure Sean Lewis will be saying the same thing, right? Yeah, no problem. It's just undefeated season with Washington State, Oregon State, Cal at Boise, at Western Michigan. Uh, walk in the park schedule, 12-0. and 0. I, I, Why only 12? Then there's the conference title, 13. Then you're in the 5-12 game at 14. Then... 15 is the quarterfinals, then 16 is the semis, then 17 is the national championship. 17 in no time, right? This isn't hard. All you have to do is win every week. This is not hard. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, Harold says he, he heard the same thing about Coach Lou. I'm nervous about him getting demoted from a – okay, these are trolls, um, which I want to say earlier in the night there were some trolls as well um, and some other Aztec channels, but I guess um, – what did they say? That um, – I don't know. <laughs> uh, Robbie, appreciate you hanging out. He says, uh, there's talks that there's a good chance that San Diego State could land four-star receiver Jordan Anderson and former San Diego High School four-star wide receiver Jeremiah McClure, who just entered the portal. McClure from UCLA, do I have that right, Robbie? I think I do. And Anderson, again, out of high school. Um, you know, keep your eyes on this. It, who knows, right? I think from afar, it's really hard to know. Some people, like Jim, who I work with on the radio, is amazingly aware of what's going on on social media, and I'm really not. He's like, did you see Jordan Anderson, like, reply to this player's, you know, tweet? And I, I'm really not aware. But, um, you know, you can read so much into that. You really, you really can. By the way, did I even mention Jason Mitchell, who's a big part of this class? I don't even think I've mentioned Jason Mitchell, and that's my apologies. Uh, Four-star DB, St. John Bosco, uh, recently committed within the last – verbally committed in the last couple of days. Huge part of this class. Um, my bad. Bad oversight on my part in the first 20 minutes of the show, Jason Mitchell. I think it was actually Jordan Anderson that replied to something Jason Mitchell posted on Instagram, a couple of fire emojis, and I got people, Aztec fans, all excited. But um, Jason Mitchell is a big part, as you – kind of round out this class and what they've done in the last 24, 48, 72 hours. I think there's a ton of excitement around Jason Mitchell. I think some of the names that people have been talking about, Mitchell, O'Neill, Duffy, Buxton, right, McMillan, Nimmo, um, Jack Morris, um, Jay Sean Polk, right? These are just, and again, I, I'm not to single anyone out, but I apologize. I, I, I knew that there was someone, I thought it was missing. That's Jason Mitchell, who's, you know, um, really high ceiling. Corner that was at one of the better high school programs in the country. Um, Chris says, thank you, Christopher. He says, Jordan Anderson would make this the best class ever. I don't have the perspective of comparing recruiting classes in Aztec history to this one. I just don't. If someone does and wants to put that in the chat, I'd be happy to pull it up. I don't have that full perspective. Um, you know, years, again, from a sheer size perspective, you're going to be looking at 20, 30, 30 plus players between now in the late signing window, it, it appears to be potentially as impactful of a class as size. Um, from a quarterback perspective, it appears to be about as good as you can do in terms of ceiling with O'Neill. But I just don't have that perspective. And I think it's it's hard when you go back to like the 80s and 90s, right? Like Marshall Falk at San Diego State. Like, what did that mean for that class? But clearly, this is a class that people are excited about. Uh, Robbie says one of the coolest things from Coach Lewis's press conference was that he started the whole thing off by thanking everyone who was working behind the scenes. I don't know if I've ever heard a San Diego State do that. Yeah, it was um, it was it was cool to see that Robbie sitting there in the room talk about the role that people behind the scenes play, and I think we all understand that. Like to be a successful organization, business, sports, otherwise, that it takes a village. I know it's cliche, but it's true, and you need you know, your compliance team to make sure that 
players are going to be eligible and credits are transferring and transcripts are completed and the admissions process is played out. And then like, I don't even know, scholarship and grant and aid and name, image, and likeness. All of these moving parts are so critically important, especially when you're trying to do something in a short period of time. This doesn't just happen with a snap of a finger. This isn't one text, one phone call, it's done. There's obviously a process to this that plays out and it takes a lot of individuals um, from across athletics, I'm sure the university, right, to make something like this a reality. And this is the nature, again, of FBS football and Division One athletics, but um, it was neat to see that, Robbie. It was neat to see that. Um, Jim says he's surprised to see that UNLV had a good class. I have no idea how any other class looks in Mountain West. I know UNLV is coming off a very good year. I I'm with you. I'm with you on the running back room. I, I think it's really solid. Um, you know, I think really good heading into the year. I think we saw some of the um, some of the payoffs here, right? Breaking out games, Armstead, Sutton. Um, you gotta like, yeah, you gotta like what they have in that with Ken Davis. Um, so 100, percent you know, that they have a nice, they have a nice room. Uh, Martin Blake, as you put in there, uh, some of the additions here today, McMillan, um, the flip from San Jose State. Um, it's been by committee the last handful of years. San Diego State's gonna run a lot of plays with Sean Lewis. You're gonna need a lot of running backs. Um, and again, I think a misconception with the Sean Lewis offense is they just want to throw the ball all over the yard. When you go back to two years ago, they had 3,500 yards of passing offense and 3,500 yards of rushing offense. So make no mistake, running backs will continue to be critically important for San Diego State moving forward. As we know, that's been as important of a position as they've had over the last you know, 10 um, yeah, we'll see. Um, as Jim says, don't forget speedy running back Kenny Kristen. He's still coming back, right? I don't know. In terms of the players that still have eligibility, I think that's still to be announced. Sean Lewis talked briefly about it today. He didn't have any specific games, but it did as if some players with eligibility that were seniors last year would return. Is that Kenny Kristen? I don't have a definitive answer on that right now, but that's another possible name to add to that room heading into 2024 if you were, Jim, to your point. Um, return. Now, let's see here. Uh, Johnny says, uh, we finally have a head coach that recognizes the void. We've had a quarterback for about a decade. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's going to be completely different on offense. No question about it. And I think it's going to be different on defense as well. But the way that John Lewis plans to modernize this offense um, is obviously you know, a factual statement. Um, it's going to be a completely different looking offense. I think the Aztecs have had some really successful quarterbacks in terms of being able to win football games. They've won a lot of games over the last decade plus, and they didn't do it necessarily with 300-yard passing game after 300-yard passing game, but they also took care of the football. They also won with their defense, which has been outstanding over the last decade. They've had top 10 FBS defenses a number of times in the last decade. They've had top 10 FBS special teams units over the last decade. So there's multiple ways to win. Um, there's no question that SDSU has a desire to improve its offense, and um, I think a lot of people believe that's going to happen in 2024. Uh, SDSU 619 says, uh, it'd be awesome to get a four-star receiver. We have a great tradition of receivers in the past, including Darnay Scott, Osgood. Uh, been a minute since we've had a deep threat with size. We talked about size. I mean, it looks like size is addressed to some extent in this class, um, and they will be bigger on the outside, and maybe they in recent years. Um, so that's a really good observation, and that is a really interesting point. Um, same person, uh, SDSU619 says, what are what other Mountain West teams have gotten as many solid commits as us this year? I'm just not sure. I would assume Boise and UNLV with how well they both did last year. Curious if you have any insight. I don't. I wish I did. I think Boise's put together a decent class from some of the stuff I followed on social media. I think they might be adding potentially Nebraska. Was it Iowa State transfer quarterback? Chubba Purdy, so he was rumored potentially as a transfer portal or grad transfer addition to Boise State. I, I just don't know. I, I don't know the extent of these classes. I think Colorado State has been able to put together a half-decent class. I know that they were up against the Aztecs for a receiver commit, and I think they landed him. Um, but it's hard enough for me to keep track with San Diego State. Um, via recruiting, it's just it's so complex. There's so many players, and unlike basketball, where it's like one, two, three player classes, talking about 20 plus players already and this will swell over the next couple of weeks and months to 30 plus players in all likelihood i mean that's that's a lot of players and a 
again, whether it's via high school or portal, FCS, FBS, it's a lot to keep track of, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Erwin, thank you. He says, we have some guys from last year's class that didn't see the field but are going to flourish in this new era. There's no question about that. There's no question. Um, that's 100%. There's no question. First, second, third, good opportunity that we haven't necessarily seen as of yet. That's just the nature of the beast playing behind veteran players. Um, but I'm sure they'll have some opportunities to flourish um, with this brand-new coaching staff in 2024 and beyond. And Robbie says, yes, UCLA just got a big time transfer receiver, and now he's – all right, appreciate um, appreciate that. Appreciate the insight there. All right, while we have a moment, and again, if you're here, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, got content for you year round. If you're a football or basketball fan, I really would appreciate that. Uh, so, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, also, I do want to tell you about our title sponsor here on the Wrap Up Show. It is my friend Eric Lanier. He is at Higher Impact Financial. So, here's the thing: Eric's a San Diegan and a lifelong San Diego sports fan. He's the founder of Higher Impact Financial, based right here in Southern California. And he's found in his research that he solves two major problems for people that meet with him. The first is that he's found that too many people do not have a financial plan, or if they do, it's outdated. Okay, and the second problem is that most of us just don't have clear, defined financial goals. And without clear goals and the clarity needed to achieve them, we all end up stuck, and this is easy to do with money. So. Here's the thing. You can set up a 15-minute call with Eric, and he will help you build a straightforward but thorough financial plan for you and your family. All right? So there's a link to Eric's website down below. And if you're looking to get better results with your wealth, then set up a free 15-minute consultation with Eric. His firm's different than anything you've experienced from a financial advisor. And we'll set some apart as the questions we'll ask to discover what truly matters to you. So again, Eric Lanier at Higher Impact Financial. If you support the channel, if you're looking for a financial planner, something to help you with your wealth, click that link in the description down below. And again, set up a free 15-minute consultation with Eric Lindner at Higher Impact Financial. All right, back to it here on the wrap-up show. Um, so again, I think you've got that playing out, and we'll see how they finish off this class. Again, we're waiting on Harrison. We're waiting on Jordan Anderson. Um, so we're still waiting, right? Um, and by the way, thank you, Joel, who's texting me during the show right now. Loyal Aztec fam. In, in regards to class rankings and in the rivals Mountain West overall recruiting rankings, San Diego State right now is number one. And in 24-7 sports, San Diego State is number two. And again, take it with a grain of salt. Take it for what it's worth. But that alone, I think, speaks for itself. It's considered to be among the better classes in the league and to put it all together as quickly as they put it all together um, gives you a lot of optimism um, for this class and what it means to San Diego State moving forward. So we can get back to football um, if you want to continue that conversation on signing day. I also wanted to mention what's going on right now with basketball because there's a critically important game tomorrow at Viejas Arena for the Aztecs. Will the Aztecs be at full strength or not? They returned from a 10-day layoff yesterday, beat St. Catherine as we expected to do, NAIA program wire to wire essentially win 20 0 run at one point led by 30 at the break but in the second half there were a number of bumps and bruises uh, lamont butler took a charge and up with a bloody nose returned so he's gonna be all right darion Tremel had a non-contact ankle injury he's been bothered by an ankle the good news there the update from mark Ziegler of the ut tonight in the ut is that Tremel practiced today and is expected to play tomorrow at what and how many minutes and what percentage we'll find out, but Tremel is critically important. Um, he just is, obviously. So, you know, school, and we know what Tremel means to the team. I don't need to tell Aztec fans what Darian Tremel means, means to the team. And then you have Jay Powell. This, to me, is the crucial piece for the Aztecs, not just tomorrow, but moving forward in terms of keeping him on the right path, because he's a transfer from Campbell that is really beginning to flourish right now at San Diego State in his final college year. Had a huge game against UC Irvine, and that come from behind win without Jaden Lede. Had maybe the play of the game, the offensive rebound before Micah Parrish's and one gave the Aztecs a 64-62 lead. And he was the one that found Parrish underneath for that bucket. And then he was playing really well before he kind of got, I don't even know, like grazed, hit, popped in the nose last night late. Um and they don't know the full extent of the injury or didn't as of last night. And I don't think did fully as of this morning either. And I think maybe seeing some type of facial specialist here today. So 
what's the extent of that injury and is he available tomorrow? Um, and you just want to see him to continue to make the strides that he's made. And I just think he's so impactful. And as they continue to develop this bench, they continue to improve because Tramel was getting healthy. Powell's just been a contributor. He got Miles Bird practicing the last couple of weeks. He's going to be an impact player. Miles Hyde, he's a freshman. We know about the starters. Start, I mean, San Diego State's got one of the better starting five units in the country. And that holds up analytically. Like, they've got an unbelievable production. Guys like Ladee, Waters, Parrish, Saunders has had his moments, right? Butler, we know what he means to the team defensively. I think he's still looking to emerge offensively like we saw at times a year ago. Um, but the more depth they can build, the better prospects you would think they have. Certainly once you get into the playing, you're playing at elevation. You don't have to be 9 or 10 deep. Don't make no mistake. You don't have to be 9 or 10 deep to win because you go back to 2020 when they went 30 and 2, they were not 9 and 10 deep. But then last year they were. So they've won both ways. Um, but again, I think if they can build out the depth, it'll give them a chance to live up to their goals for the year, right? And Dutch has talked about the fact that for them to accomplish their goals, um, well, they know they can't play starters near 40 minutes a game, especially at elevation, because you're going to wear down in second halves doing that. And the other thing is to play the defense they need to play, you're going to need to run through players, right? And they've talked about still an ability to grow both defensively and in rebounding both the offensive and defensive end. And I think we've begun to see it, and I think there have been flashes of it, but there's still a lot of growth in there, and they've got the time now to do it if they can stay healthy. The 10-day window here during finals is after Stanford, before Gonzaga, and a lot of opportunities to practice and get better and hopefully get healthier. So we'll wait on Pal. We'll wait on Trammell. Um, cross your fingers on Pal. Hopefully they're able to dodge a bullet. Hopefully it's nothing of you know, great significance, even if it's a setback. Hopefully it's a minor setback as opposed to a major setback. But He's a critically important piece. I really like the way he's playing. I really like his potential in the second half of this year as well for SDSU. In terms of tomorrow's game and what it means, it means a ton for the Aztecs. You might be saying, well, what are you talking about, John? They've got Kentucky coming up. They haven't even started conference play. Why is Stanford at home? You know, an average, I'm saying that, an average metric team, such a critically important team uh, or game. Well, let me tell you why. First of all, you're not an average team if you look at Ken Palm. They're right now in the top 95 of Ken Palm, which is a good team. If you're in the top 100, you're a good team. And right now in Ken Palm, they are 93rd at 5-4 and four overall. Now, in the net, they are much further behind at 155. But they keep moving up. Even yesterday without playing, they go from 160 to 155. They went away from getting a boost, 20 spots, 30 spot boost. Where San Diego State trying to avoid a quarter fall against a really good veteran team with good skills, again, fourth and fifth year players and capable scorers. So they're dangerous. I thought Washington was clearly dangerous. San Diego State was able to find a way to win in overtime. Cal was obviously dangerous. San Diego State was able to find a way to win in overtime. This is one of those games that would be. Um, perceived as a red flag in a resume, even though it's not what I would deem to be a bad loss because I think Stanford's going to have some level of success. It's not a good amount of success in the Pac-12 that's, that's way down a little bit, that it's not having a ton of success as a league overall outside of maybe in Arizona. So you get this one. You've done everything you could possibly ask for in the non-conference. Your only losses are quad one road games, Grand Canyon, BYU. And even if you don't beat Gonzaga, you would have three road quad one losses. That's it out of the non-conference. And you would have held serve everywhere else and picked up some quality wins. Maybe not that, you know, complete resume building, you know, top 10 type quad one win, but good wins in the non-conference. But this is the one that you can't afford, quote unquote, to slip up. And I don't even know how much of a slip up it would be. I'm expecting a very good game. I think San Diego State will need to play well to win tomorrow night. Um, I think it's Stanford's first true road game of the year. Um, they've been close in some of their losses, double overtime loss, I think, to Arkansas, two possession loss to Michigan this year. They were that with a starter in their Santa Clara loss. So I think the five and four is very deceiving with Stanford. And I think San Diego State is very capable of winning this game. They just need to play well to win this game. So get there, 6 p.m. start, be loud, I'll make a difference. Crowds always make a difference in VA House Arena and understand that 
well, it's not the end all be all. The season's not on the line tomorrow night. It's not a quote unquote must win. But for the Aztecs, as they build this resume, it's one of those games you want to get from a resume perspective, just to keep things in line. Not that it's going to look like it's end of the year, a quote unquote good win. It may not because it would be a home win against a team that right now is in the 150. But you also want to prepare against a quote unquote bad loss. But I don't really know how bad it would be when you look at their roster and what they're capable of doing. Um, they scream dangerous to me. They really do. That's how I look at it. So that's my spiel on San Diego State hoops uh, heading into tomorrow night, which is uh, again, a big game for the Aztecs and a week off. They'll be in Spokane. Then the Aztecs come here next year, which is pretty cool. They haven't been here since 2017. Um, Don says, yeah, great news on Tramel. Yes, yeah, so hopefully practicing. I, I, that surprised me after seeing him walk off. Um, it kind of hobbled off yesterday. I figured he probably wouldn't practice today, and they'd make the game time decision tomorrow. And maybe it still is. Maybe they see how he feels tomorrow after practicing here today. But I think it is definitely encouraging news. Um, key contributor, important piece, capable of you know 15, 20 points in a game um, can be the difference between winning and losing. Provides you depth at the you know point guard position, which you absolutely need, especially tomorrow against um, a team that plays eight, nine, ten, eleven guys. Um, it has a really good point guard as well. And Stanford, I think a Providence transfer um, it was a critically important piece for Stanford. So, yeah, it is great news. I agree with you on Trammell. Rai says uh, early on this season, have the focus on defense been at the expense of offense? I really like our improved offensive threat, but our performance against Irvine concerned me. Has the focus on No, I, you know, I think San Diego State offense, and I'll look it up. I think the Aztecs offense is actually something pretty good. I think defensively, San Diego State um, has also been pretty good. Um, so adjusted offense at Ken Palm, San Diego State is the 42nd best adjusted offense in the country, which is better than they finished a year ago at right. And they were in the national championship game. I'd have to confirm that. They have the 29th best adjusted offense. So they've been good at both ends. Now, a year ago, their adjusted defense was better than that, and their adjusted offense was worse than that. I think I have that right. Uh, let's see here. So San Diego State entered the tournament a year ago, 14th in Ken Palm, um, or maybe ended the season actually 14th in Ken Palm, including the NCAA tournament. They were 75th in adjusted offense. So the offense is drastically improved in the first half of the year from 75 to 42, a 33 spot bump. That's a drastic improvement. However, the Aztecs ended last year with the fourth best adjusted defense. They're at 29. So they've slid 25 spots, but just doing math, plus 33 in offense, minus 25 in defense. The Aztecs overall in that analogy are actually plus eight at both ends from where they were a year ago when they finished 14th in Ken Palm and made a national championship game. It's impossible, by the way, to compare any team to another team. I, I'm, I'm never trying to say that because of what happened last year, that means this year's team is going to go further. It, it, we have no idea. I mean, there's so many particulars. The strength of your non-conference schedule, the strength of the league. Um, NCAA tournament is a one-and-done format. It's not best of seven. I'm just saying there are encouraging signs based on where San Diego State is right now, despite the fact that they still have room for growth. Because offensively, they've been really good. You know, top 50 offense is a really good offense, especially with the way San Diego State traditionally plays defense. So there's a lot of encouraging signs. Right now, San Diego State and Ken Palm is inside the top 30. Last year, they finished 14th. I think they're where is it? 31st. I think they entered the day at 29th. Uh, they've been inside the top 30 of the net. But again, as you know, if you're a college basketball fan, as you know, if you're an Aztec fan, all these games are pretty important. That's the truth. They all add up. Um, where San Diego State's been really good over the years is they avoid taking on water traditionally in the net era, definitely. And, you know, under Steve Fisher and Brian Dutcher, I mean, they typically win games they're supposed to win especially at home where they win about 90% of the time or more over the last 10 or 15 years. So Viejas is a tough place to play. Let's see if Aztec fans can make it a tough place to play tomorrow night. When the Stanford Cardinal come to town, 6 o'clock is the tip time. Uh, you can listen to it, by the way, as you drive over there. Our pregame coverage will begin at 5 p.m. on San Diego Sports 760. SDSU 619 says really need guys like Saunders and Waters to show up strong over the next two games. I think they've both been great this year. I think they both exceeded expectations. Water has been plug and play, easier said than done as a transfer with all the complexities of any team. But the way San Diego State plays, how hard they play on defense, Waters has been unbelievable. And Saunders, as a 
a guy that didn't play a lot last year because of the depth and the veteran and the experience you had a year ago. Saunders has been an extremely valuable piece starting every game here for San Diego State. So, again, like I said earlier, I think from a starting five perspective, and you add in Darion, you got some elite players. And then as you bring along Jay Powell, we've seen it. As you bring along Miles Bird, Miles Heidi, Demarche Johnson Jr., right? You can really, you have the makings of being pretty deep. You can get healthy and stay healthy. That's what they had a year ago. That's one of those things that's out of your control. I want to hit on that briefly. I've talked about it over the last 24 hours. I saw in my DM, um, I saw on social media, and I got text from John and Jim. Why is Jay Powell playing? Why is Darion Chamel playing? Why is Lamont Butler playing? They're leading by a lot. Why are these guys? Leading? The guys want to play. They haven't played for 10 days. They're getting ready for Stanford. You want to shake off Frost. Jane Ledee said it last night to me. He's like, I hadn't played two weeks. Like, it was a little unnatural like i needed to show myself that i was good to go and i needed to shake off some rust i felt like i was able to do that there's a fine line but nobody played more than 21 minutes last night and that was a bench player in miles bird no starter played more than 18 minutes you only have 15 players what 11 guys right now for san diego state available on scholarship guys got to play and they want to play nobody's saying play guys 40 minutes they played walk-ons last night eight nine minutes what else can you possibly do um, there's reasons for games like that. Out of finals, you typically play a non-division one opponent way back into the schedule. Everyone wants to avoid injuries, but it's easier said than done. Nobody can predict when injuries are going to occur. Hopefully, San Diego State's fortunate here, considering everything, with what we learned on Tremel tonight from Mark Ziegler. We still need to learn more on Jay Powell. Um, but cross your fingers there, and hopefully Powell is available tomorrow night. And hopefully, again, in the grand scheme, it's a shorter-term injury as opposed to a longer term one for SDSU, but I, I have no idea. I saw it like you all saw it last night. We wait. Um, wait on Pal. Don says Saunders reminds him of Matt Nichols, which is taller. That's an interesting comp, like a body size type. Um, and Mitchell, has, Mitchell had so much development um, throughout the course of his four-year career. I think we've already seen that in parts of two years at Elijah Saunders as well. Yeah, I kind of I like that. I mean, there are some comparisons. Um, I don't think they're, I mean, obviously they're not identical players, but I, I think there's some top there. And um, what we're seeing from Saunders as a sophomore, I think is really encouraging for what he can provide in the second half of this year and moving forward on the Mesa as, uh, as well. I'm trying to think, is there anything really that we missed on that we should have touched on here tonight? If there is, if you wouldn't mind putting it in the chat, I'd be happy to get to it right now. Um, really would. And again, if you're here, for those that are new to the channel, and probably a lot of you are, because I've only been doing the channel for a handful of months. I've probably only done, you could look at the all-time history of the channel. I've probably done five to 10 live shows and another five or 10 videos, something like that, right guys? So if you wouldn't mind telling Aztec fans about this, I really do appreciate it, I really do. Uh, if you wouldn't mind subscribing, I really do appreciate that. If you hit the like button for me, if you follow me on social media, at John Schaefer on Twitter, J-O-N-S-C-H-A-E-F-F-E-R. As I move ahead, I'll tell you more about some things I'm working on, whether it's memberships where you get like emojis and badges, custom emojis and badges if you become a member. I'm going to do some member live streams as well, member-only live streams for those um, that support the channel in that way. Um, so, again, we'll tell you more about it as we continue on. But, again, this is for Aztec fans, football fans, men's basketball fans, year-round content, trying to provide as much possible content as I can with the day job with the night job around San Diego State basketball games, the radio and football and the Padres wrap-up show that I do. But I think there's really a, a great space on YouTube to provide this type of niche content for Aztec fans because I think there's really a yearning for it. So I've, I've sensed it over the last couple of months doing shows like this. Um, there's a lot of people that have been interacting, whether it's live or on replay. So I really do appreciate those interactions. I appreciate you letting people know. And I thank you for subscribing to the channel. Uh, let's see here. Before we get out of here, just to get to a couple of comments that are uh, rolling in. Oh, we just had that up. Um, all right. I think that's going to do it. Again, a uh, signing day success for Sean Lewis on the Mason. Dick is going to join me tomorrow on John and Jim at 3.10 p.m. So we'd love to have you on the radio, San Diego Sports 760, always available for free, by the way, on the iHeartRadio app. You can also stream our show on YouTube by searching for John and Jim 760. But we'll catch up with J.D. Wicker on 
this initial signing class for Sean Lewis on San Diego State basketball tomorrow night against Stanford about everything going on in the crazy, wacky world of college athletics. So J.D. Wicker will join us tomorrow at 310. Then our Aztec pregame coverage at 5 p.m. A tip-off tomorrow night, San Diego State and Stanford at 6 p.m. from inside Viejas Arena. All right. Until next time, I want to thank, uh, again, our title sponsor, Eric Lanier at Higher Impact Financial. If you have financial needs, set up a 15-minute call with Eric Lanier, a free consultation, and he will help you with your financial planning. You can click that link in the description down below. Um, we will catch up at some point in the next couple of days here on The Wrap-Up Show. And uh, until next time, my name is John Schaefer, and you've been watching The Wrap-Up Show. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.